So there are a whole bunch of different image processing effects that you can accomplish in Game Maker just by writing a few simple shaders, and in the coming weeks and months, and honestly at the rate that I get things done, probably years, I would like to make videos on some of them. So, hello all the crazy people out there, my name is Michael, I like wizards and dragons and making games, and welcome to Shader Effects in Game Maker. Today we're going to start off by doing a uh, fairly simple image processing effect, image filtering effect in a shader in Game Maker, and that is going to be grayscale. Uh, before I write any lines of code, before I do anything with the shader editor, I, I would like to acknowledge the elephant in the room that Game Maker in the last perhaps year or so uh, has started adding a bunch of these fancy filter effects, filters and uh, filters and effect layers to the room editor. And there's a whole bunch of them. If you don't know how these work, uh, they're pretty straightforward. You can apply a particular effect to um, different layers in the room editor. I made a video on them when they first came out that you may be interested in referring to. Uh, and one of them happens to be a grayscale shader. They call it desaturate, I call it grayscale, whatever. And uh, this is great for simple effects. This is great if all you need is to apply a particular effect to a, uh, to a layer. In the room editor, you can do things like set the, uh, set the intensity of the effect. And for a lot of people, there's a good chance that this is all you need. And since Yo-Yo Games has done the hard work of creating all these effects for you, uh, there's really no reason to reinvent the wheel and write your own shaders that do the exact same thing. But if you want to do more advanced things, such as combining these effects with other effects or combining these effects with other shaders, uh, you're going to want to write your own. Or maybe you're just like me and you have an insatiable desire for all kinds of useless information and you just want to know how these things work, then uh, this video is for you. So I'm going to delete this, uh, this layer filter effect and I'm going, to, um, I'm going to close out of the room editor for now. Uh, to start with, I'm just going to apply the, uh, the effect to the duckling sprite who's walking around on the overworld. I'm not going to apply it to like everything in the game. So let me, let me hop into a shader. Uh, let me go create myself a new shader. I'm going to call this shd underscore grayscale. And I'm not going to touch the vertex shader. I'm not even going to bother to touch all the, the junk in the vertex shader that I usually like to clean up because it really bothers me the way that we have object space position equals this horrendous line of code. Um, and I'm just going to pop over to the fragment shader. So there's two ways that people often go about achieving grayscale in a shader. And there's one way which is okay, and it's very simple, and it's very straightforward, and it's probably what most people think of first when they first try to write a grayscale shader. And there's another way that's a little bit more involved, and by that I mean it's like one or two extra lines of code, and it produces a slightly better result. So I'm going to take on the simple version first. Most of you probably have an idea of where I'm going with this, but first, uh, the, um, the color that we're sampling from the texture and multiplying by the vertex color, I'm going to, instead of assign, assigning that to gl underscore frag color, I'm going to assign that to vec4, uh, let's call it original color. And since the color gray in red, green, blue color values is just the same amount of red, the same amount of green, the same amount of blue, uh, it stands to reason that if you were to sum up the red, the green, and the blue values of this, of this original color and divide them by three, so if you were to just take the average of the, um, of the red, green, and blue color values, then what you should get, I'm just going to call this float gray, then what you should get is going to be a pretty satisfying approximation of a, a grayscale color value from, a, uh, from any given color. So this is going to be a, a scalar value. This is just a float. Uh, we are going to want a, a vector 4 built out of the same amount of, of like grayish color on the red, green, and blue. So I'm not even intending to uh, confuse the spellings, the American and non-American spellings of the word gray. Um, it's just something that happens because I've spent so much time staring at the, uh, the IDE for Game Maker. Anyway, the red, green, and blue uh, values are going to be the, uh, the gray amount of the new color that we're creating, of the gray color that we're creating. The alpha is going to be original color dot alpha. Uh, we can save this to another, another variable. I'm going to call this vec4. Let's call it gray scale color. And then uh, at the end, we can just assign gl frag color this value. 
And this should be a pretty satisfying uh, approximation of a grayscale color value. I am going to go into uh, OBJ Duckling's draw event, and at the beginning of the draw event, shader set SHD underscore grayscale, and at the end of the draw event, I'm going to turn it off shader reset. And this is going to give us a uh, this is going to give us a grayscale image. All right, we look like a we look like a I don't know a statue version of the of the duckling or something. The duckling carved into stone or um, something like that. That's fine. All right. Um, I would say that about fifty percent of you are screaming at your monitors right now, telling me that that is not correct. And the uh, the reason that that is not correct for the other fifty percent of you is, uh, let's say that I have a couple different different shades of color. So what I've got here is I've got the same duckling sprite recolored to red, green, and blue. And this is the same amount of red, the same amount of green, and the same amount of blue that I've recolored the sprites with. Um, this is, uh, like, the brightest parts of this are about 255 red, the brightest, the brightest parts of this are about 255 green and blue. And uh, they, uh, you wouldn't perhaps know that by looking at them. They, look, they do look like they are different brightnesses. Uh, because as it turns out, human eyes perceive different um, different red, green, blue primary colors at different levels. We perceive green to be brighter than blue, and red tends to fall somewhere in the middle of green and blue. And if I were to, when I'm drawing these uh, these red, green, and blue ducklings on the side of the screen, uh, we would see that if I were to apply the grayscale shader to these ducklings on the side of the screen, um, that despite, and I'm actually going to draw, I'm actually going to draw the, uh, the grayscale version next to the originals so that you can, uh, you can see the difference in real time side by side. Uh, you're going to see that each of these grayscale images come out approximately the same because they're, um, even though we perceive these colors to be of different brightnesses inside the computer, they're all stored with the same numeric values on the red, green, and blue color channels and that causes them to come out with the same grayscale value as each other. And that's not really satisfying. It would be a little bit nice if the lighter in appearance green values could appear to be brighter when it comes to the grayscale than the, uh, the darker in appearance blue values, even if they have the same, um, the same numeric brightness values and they're having the pixels in your monitor shine at the same intensity. So I'm gonna correct this and I'm gonna start by rewriting this line here. This line 10, float gray equals original color dot red plus green plus blue divided by three. Uh, I'm going to rewrite this. I'm going to say instead uh, float gray is going to be equal to... Um, and I think I'm going to break this up over multiple lines because it might get a little bit long. Uh, original color dot red times 0 0.333 uh, plus original color dot green times 0 0.333 plus original color dot blue times 0 0.333. And uh, we can agree that these two lines are effectively the same as each other, right? Dividing this, uh, dividing this sum by uh, 3.0 is the same as multiplying this sum by 0 0.333, plus or minus some rounding error. So what we can do is we can give each of these red, green, and blue color channels a different weight. And the, uh, the default weights, one third, one third, one third, they all add up to 1.0 if you were to um, calculate the result of this for a white pixel, you would end up with just one times a third plus one times a third plus one times a third, and you add those together, get 1.0, and then when you rebuild the color from those grayscale values, you would get, again, white as you started with. Um, as long as these three factors add up to 1.0, then we should be good. The calculation should check out. And there's a couple different weights that people have given red, green, and blue over the years to account for the differences in brightnesses as we perceive them. But the one that seems to have won out, and the one that is, uh, I believe, at the top of the Wikipedia page for Luma in, like, video color encoding, is going to be about 0 0.299 for red, uh, is going to be 0 0.587 for green, and 0 0.114 for blue. And these numbers do show up a lot when you go around looking for grayscale calculations of color values on the internet. This is all they're doing. They're weighting the three color channels so the green appears brighter than blue. Uh, you can look at the numbers themselves and you can reason through how it, uh, how it works. Green has a stronger weight than blue, so uh, a little bit of green will have a stronger uh, influence on the overall brightness calculation than red or blue will. And now, if I were to run the game, then we are still going to have grayscale, but you can see the ducklings on the side of the screen right here. 
Uh, they are of different brightnesses based on whether they are red, green, or blue. So the blue duckling at the bottom looks the, uh, the darkest. And indeed, I think most people would agree, if you have a full color vision, that the blue duckling at the bottom does look darker than the, uh, the first two. And the green one in the middle, again, assuming you have a full color vision, is um, brighter than the other two. And the, uh, the yellow duckling, the one who has not been recolored, has a, is, is lighter still. Although, um, the way that I recolored them wasn't just a, a straight color conversion, so... Uh, the color values in the, in the default duckling sprite are a little bit different. Okay. So this is really fine for a simple grayscale calculation. This is fine. Uh, you can take this a step further. Well, you can take this a step further in a few other respects. And um, you might occasionally see in, um, in shader code, instead of saying like the grayscale value and uh, the more scientifically correct term, the more scientifically accurate term, I think will be Luma. Uh, Luma in color refers to the brightness as we perceive it, uh, which is kind of what I've been talking about this entire video, or at least the second half of this entire video. And if you wanted more information on this, you could look on the Wikipedia page for Luma or Lumiance in, in video encoding. So I'm going to call it that, uh, rather than like grayscale value or brightness or something like that. Um, just so that, and I, I kind of learned this the hard way when I made shader videos in the past. If anyone sees one of these videos and wants to learn more, it really helps if I, uh, if I use the same terms as everyone else on the internet so that people know what to look up. Uh, because if I just invent my own words, it's harder to look it up later. Anyway, if you know the dot product like the back of your hand and you look at these three lines of code, you might start to think that this looks an awful lot like just the long form of a dot product. And if you were to instead say, uh, let's rewrite this line of code again, float luma, is going to equal the dot product of original color dot RGB uh, against a vector three containing 0 0.299, 0 0.587, 0 0.114. And if you were to think that these two lines of code are to be equivalent, uh, you would be correct. The dot product, all it does is it multiplies the components of uh, two vectors that are the same size and adds the products together, which is exactly what we're doing here. Um, if you like dot products, I would recommend using this version just because it's a shorter line of code and it looks better. If you are not like 100% solid on dot products, one, you probably should make yourself 100% solid on dot products because when you use shaders, they appear all the time. Uh, but if you were to just leave this line of code like this, then there is a not a real downside. I guess you could make the argument that it's a longer line of code and there's more opportunities to, for errors to slip in, but whatever. Uh, if I run the game now with the dot product, I didn't. I accidentally deleted the, the dot product. If I run the game now with the dot product, uh, we are going to end up with the same thing that we had before. All right, cool. That's equivalent. Now, uh, there's one more thing, and I wasn't originally going to include this actually until I looked at the uh, until I looked at the grayscale desaturate filter effect and noticed that it um. It has an intensity slider so that you could apply like a partial uh, grayscale effect or a uh, just that's why they call it desaturate really you could desaturate the image a little bit without um without bringing it all the way down to zero last july i did make a video on hue saturation and value um shaders in game maker as well as just straight up hue shifts and uh messing with the saturation that way is going to be a lot like messing with the uh the intensity of the grayscale value the uh, of the grayscale value this way uh, I can just throw in a uniform, I'm going to call it uniform, uh, let's say it's going to be a float, a uh, uniform float. Uh, let's prefix it with a U for uniform and let's call it grayscale value. Or let's call it grayscale amount. And we're going to pass this in as a uniform to the shader when we set it. And it's going to, uh, it's going to be a value between 0 and 1. And this is just going to be, uh, 1 is going to be 100% grayscale. Uh, zero is going to be no grayscale, so the original color. And for any value in between, we can uh, we can do a little linear interpolation between the original color and the grayscale color. And it makes me incredibly sad that the uh, the lerp function in GLSL is instead called mix instead of lerp. Um, mix just means linear interpolation in GLSL for a uh, either a scalar value or a vector. I really think it's a missed opportunity. Uh, just whenever you could call a function lerp and you don't, uh, you're depriving everyone who's ever going to say the name of the function out loud from the uh, the joys of saying the word lerp. 
Anyway, we can go from the original color to the grayscale color, and the amount is going to be u underscore grayscale amount. And when we set the shader, when, we, uh, when we're drawing either the duckling itself, or when we are in the draw GUI event and we are drawing the, um, like the example duckies on the side of the screen, uh, we can shader set uniform float. Uh, the uniform ID is going to be shader get uniform, shd underscore grayscale. And the value can be, for example, uh, 1 would be 100%. And if you want to see what it looks like when we are drawing a, gr a grayscale image with a uh, value that is not 100%, uh, we could... Oh, I also need to provide the uniform name, which is just u underscore grayscale amount. I was going to say, it looks like something is uh, is incomplete here, and there's that yellow yellow mark shouting at me. Anyway, in the draw GUI event where we're drawing the multicolored ducks, uh, we could do the same thing, we could set the uniform. If you uh, if you don't want to see just what it looks like when we are drawing 100% gray, uh, we can, um, oh, I don't know, we could have a, uh, a value that oscillates between zero and one. Uh, we could do something like, um, let's say, sign of current time divided by a thousand, and that's gonna be uh, converting current time into seconds. You take the sign value of that to make it oscillate between negative one and positive one. Uh, times 0 0.5 to put that in a range of negative 0.5 to positive 0.5 plus 0 0.5 to put it in a range of 0 to 1. Um, if you don't understand this line of code just by looking at it, don't worry about it. All it's going to do is give us a value that oscillates between 0 and 1 smoothly. Um, so it's one of the handy little lines of math. And uh, am I resetting the shader at the when I'm done? I am. Why was the... Uh, why was the entire screen grayed out? Oh, you know what I did is I, uh, I I accidentally didn't delete the layer effect in the room, so the room editor is still being drawn with the layer effect. Oops. Anyway, this is going to give us a, a bouncing value between 100% grayscale, which it is right now, and 0% grayscale, which it is right now, and it's going to have a period of about three seconds. Hey. Um, so there you can see us smoothly transitioning between different amounts of grayscale. And that's all I have to say on this matter. Um, there's uh, there's not much more to it. This is a pretty simple effect. Again, it's only a couple lines of shader code. Um, there's a lot you can do with it. Uh, grayscale is the basis of a lot of color grading effects, uh, such as uh, sepia sepia color grading. Uh, there's uh, there's other kinds of color grading for like nighttime um, toning an image to like sunset colors or um, midnight blues or that kind of thing. But that's all I have today. If you want the code for this, uh, there's not much of it, but look for the link to the GitHub repository down in the video description, and I will commit this change. Apparently, I forgot to commit the base project. Anyway, that's done. Look for the link to the GitHub repository down in the video description. I have a Patreon, so if you want to contribute towards these videos being made, look for the link to that in all the usual places as well. You could see some fun things like your name in the credits, and about once a month I like to post a preview of my future plans and that kind of thing. And if you wanted to pledge, I would definitely appreciate it. I try to post game dev videos about twice a week. One tutorial tutorial like this, and one let's make a game. So if you're interested in anything like that, feel free to subscribe. I hope you all found that useful, and I will see you all later. Special thanks to Army Armbuster, DJ Gibbles, Edward Holt, Game Maker, Gunnar Clovis, KeyXE, Syndra Larson, Square Crow, and Zenjamin for supporting these videos. If you want to support this channel yourself, head on over to the Patreon page down in the video description to join the fun.